Shalom, everybody. Shalom, shalom. Okay, just uh, I recognize a lot of faces. Thank God, I'm honored that you're here. Um, I'll give you, though, just a quick intro for those who I haven't met before. Shalom, my name is Ellie. I'm originally from a place called Teaneck, New Jersey. Jersey, anybody? Oh, no. no one's gonna admit it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really from New Jersey. And, yeah, New Jersey was so amazing that I left there about 14 years ago, and I made the move to the Holy Land. Oh, yeah. And there I was, having made the move to the Holy Land. I'm a few weeks into this, and I am wandering around the streets of the old city of Jerusalem, and I bump into a few people I know from Toronto, Canada. And me and them get to talking. With them, there was this other young lady. Me and her get to talking. What do you know? To make a short story shorter, me and this gal end up getting hitched. And so it just goes to show you that some people come to the old city of Jerusalem for God, other people for the ladies. What's up? <laughs> so uh, anyway, since then, thank God, we've been blessed to live in a bunch of locations here in Israel. I lived a couple of years in an area called Gush Etzion, which is about 20 minutes south of Jerusalem. We lived a year in a neighborhood here in Jerusalem called Katamon, as I'm sure you know. <clears throat> we lived actually two years in, down south in Beersheba, across the street from Ben Gurion University. We were involved with outreach on a campus there. And now, thank God, we're blessed to live the last eight years, actually, in the old city of Jerusalem, living in a place overlooking the spot that we met. Oh, there you go. Great. Anyway, this is a great story, but actually has nothing to do with why I'm here talking to you today. What brings me here to talk to you today is that when I was growing up, and I'm sure there are people here from all sorts of backgrounds, Jewishly, maybe some people have some Jewish background, maybe some people no Jewish background, maybe some, maybe some people like a Jew-ish kind of background, if you know what I'm saying. But when I was growing up, anything I ever heard about Judaism, it was a lot about the what's of Judaism and the how's of Judaism, what to do, how to do it. But like, why on earth should I be involved in this? Why on earth might I care? Why on earth might this make a difference in my life? Somehow those whys were always passed over. And so growing up, this bothered me. And I wanted to check out some of this Jewish stuff out for myself. So I came here to Israel, started searching things out. Right? And this starts out as a philosophical pursuit, but ultimately evolves into something a little more personal, <coughs> a little more spiritual, a little more to the wise of Judaism, more Kabbalistic side of things. And so essentially this is what um, inspires me, and this is what I think a lot of times is missing. So um, a lot of times this is what I like to talk about, a little bit more the deeper side of things, the wise of things, deeper meaningfulness behind why we do what we do, etc., etc. So that's a little bit my story, that's a little bit where I'm coming from. And here goes. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Go. go. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here we go. Um, so they asked me to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, uh, something having to do with uh, the weekly portion, etc. So anyway, these these portions that we're in now in the Torah talk about Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and, and Esau. And so what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about that, but from a, a little bit of an internal kind of perspective, meaning to say that a lot of times when we see, when we think. Judaism, or when we think Torah, certainly these portions that talk about Abraham, Isaac, Jake, etc., we think about Jewish history. We think about the story. And that's good and that's fine, but the truth is that's surface level. Because what we mean by Torah is, well, what do we mean by Torah? Literally, the word Torah, of course, <clears throat> literally, the word Torah is related to the Hebrew word Mora. Mora, teacher. So Torah really is teachings, right? Teachings for what? teachings for life, which means to say that really what the Torah is, in a certain respect, is kind of like the original self-help book, right? Spiritual self-help book, right? Meaning to say that that's really what it's all about. So if we read over the Torah and well, what we learned from it was just some Jewish history, so then we missed really what the book is all about, right? Okay, we got some level of it, but if all you took away is history, so then it's time to, you know, go rewind back to the beginning and start over once again because you missed what the book was really all about. And so this is, what having this in mind, I think I want to look a little bit more at what we, uh, at the concept of Yaakov and, um, and Asa from a more internal perspective. It means to say that the Torah is talking about Yaakov and Asa. It means to tell us that there is something going on within us called Yaakov and there's something going on within us called Asa. Right? And let's understand what we mean by that. Okay? Because what we're going to find is that Yaakov and Asa in the Torah uh, have certain traits about them that are mentioned. So for example, Yaakov, when, 
when, they, when, it's, when he's mentioned, is referred to as an ishtam yoshevo halim in Hebrew. Those are two things. Ishtam means someone who's wholesome, and yoshev halim means literally a dweller of tents. Let's understand this. Okay, ishtam means a wholesome, or sometimes it's translated even as simple. It doesn't mean simple like a fool. It means, someone who's wholesome means that there's a certain level of directness about it, right? Like a certain level of clarity, a certain level of not making all sorts of other roundabout explanations and reasonings and things like this. But a certain level of simpleness meaning to say what's in what's put in front of me, this is the way it's this is the way it is, this is the way it's supposed to be, and not with all sorts of other calculations. Right? And so Really, each time, one of the ways of understanding it means a certain concept of what's called in Hebrew, Yirat Shemayim, or Yirat Hashem, which means a certain level of awe of God, clarity, God clarity, right? Where's the word Yira? It often translated as fear or awe, but really Yira is from the Hebrew word Ro'e, which means to see, right? Because, so it's a certain level of seeing God, a certain level of God clarity. However, is God clarity enough? The answer is not really, right? And it means you need that. But then you can have God, you can have a certain level of all God of wanting to experience God, which is great and beautiful and necessary. But if you don't have the means to do it, if you don't have the knowledge how to connect to God, so then you're gonna have to, you're not gonna be able to fulfill that to the extent you would like to. And that's the second half, right? That Jacob is also referred to as a Yoshevo Halim, which literally means a dweller of tents. But what that means is that he looks at this world as a tent. Now, what is a tent when you compare it with a house? Temporary. temporary, right? That's exactly the point. And so Yaakov, this idea of a dweller of tents, um, say the commentaries, is referring to Jacob being someone who studies Torah, meaning to say he's in this world, he's learning Torah, right? And, and through this, also coming to a place, they're learning or practicing Torah, coming to a place of seeing this world as not as the end-all, be-all of what life's all about, right? Not the end-all, be-all, but... Um, instead, he's, he's understanding there's something deeper going on over here in this world. The external physicality of this world isn't the end-all, be-all of this physical world. And so therefore, this is the concept of Yosheva, a dweller of tents, which means, according to the commentaries, this concept of Torah study. And so this is the complete picture. On the one hand, each time, a certain wholesomeness, a certain saying, okay, here's God, it's clear. But then, how do I go ahead and live out and build that relationship with God? That's the concept of Yosheva, a dweller of tents, which is the concept of Torah learning. Right? And you need both of these things. You need both the Ishtam aspect and the Yoshev Alim aspect. You need, on the one hand, the clarity or the inspiration on the one hand, and also the practical know-how on the other hand. And we're going to understand why that is today. But before we do this, let's also understand what Esav is all about. Esav is the other side. Esav is described in the Torah, Esav is described in the Torah as um, in Ish, uh, a Tsayad. A Tsayad means a a hunter, right? Because he is hunting, he is seeking out, really, to do the opposite. He's seeking, he's seeking, how do I go ahead and in these concepts of holiness and goodness and whatever that Jacob wants to do, how do I go ahead, the Jacob within oneself, so to speak, how do I go ahead, I hunt out holiness. How do I put in there a little bit of an ulterior motive. How do I go in there and get him to do the, okay, he's going to do the right thing, let me, get, let me get him to do the right thing, but for the wrong reason, right? He's on fire for, for goodness, for godness, for passion, for Judaism, whatever it might be. How do I cool that off a little bit? How do I say, ah, don't be <laughs> such a fanatic, just, uh, you know, be uh, flexidox. You know, how do I get him to go from that place of on fire to a certain place of dissipated passion, right? This is what, this is Asa, this is the, the, the hunter, so to speak, <laughs> that Asa is. And so we have to understand that really everything we just said, the Yaakov side versus the Asa side, and if we understand it in a certain way that I would like to explain it here today, really is going to get into our, our joy versus the opposite. Our joy, how much joy we're feeling, how much high, we're, how much real fullness we're feeling in life versus. Um, how we're kind of maybe, God, God forbid, feeling the opposite, right? Because really in here is included, I think, the secrets of joy and really depression also. And let's explain how, okay? Let's explain how. Because let's understand first what we mean by joy. Well, actually, first let's understand what we mean, what we don't mean by joy. Let's look at one of the, really what the culture, in a certain respect, has put in our mind, right? That the culture here 
that we were brought up in has put in our mind some misconceptions about joy. Right? They put in the back of our mind that our joy is a dependent, that it's dependent how, on how much stuff you get, on what you receive, on what you intake will determine your level of joy. Right? Like they put in the back, uh, like they put in the back of our mind this calculation that if only I had that blank, you fill in the blank, then I'd be happy, right? If only I had that girl, then I'd be happy. If only I had that guy, then I'd be happy. If only I had that job, if only I had that car, if only I had that six-figure income, if only I had those looks, if only I had that figure, if only I had that life, then I'd be happy. What happens? Imagine one day you get one of those things. Imagine you get something big. Imagine you win the lottery. So then, yeah, of course, you're going to have a high from that. But even the psychologist will tell you that maximum, maximum, that high will last no longer than six weeks. Then you come down from that high, and you're the same depressed loser you were before, just with more money. And so what we see from that, right, listen, I'd rather be that guy than the other guy. Don't get me wrong. But what we see from this is that that high, right, that what we see from this is that our level of joy isn't dependent on how much stuff we get. That the truth is, the studies that have been done on this actually say that, now that we're mentioning it, the studies that have been done on this say that up to $75,000, this is American studies, up to $75,000, yes, your money will affect your level of happiness. Past $75,000, no correlation to your happiness. Right? Why? What does it mean to point out? It means to say, bottom line is that there's a certain level you need to get a certain level of survival. You're not like chasing your tail all the time. A certain level of stability, right? But then past that, your level of happiness in life is going to have nothing to do with the amount of money you make. So it means to say that, yes, we, need to, we do need to get or receive a certain amount in order to get by, a certain amount of food, water, companionship in order to get by. But that's survival. That's not thriving. Real thriving, real joy is going to have nothing to do with what we get, only to do with what we give forth. And by giving forth, I don't mean give a dollar to the guy on the street. That's very nice, not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is real giving of self. To the extent I clarify who I really am, what I'm really here for, what my life is really all about, and I make real moves in order to get there. So it might not be easy, it might not be comfortable, but if everything else is healthy, depressed, I'm not going to be. Because I'm going ahead and living out the inner reality of who I am into fruition and into actualization. And this is really what we mean by joy in a nutshell. Now, if we can break this down to a one-liner, I think we could say that joy is the experience of actualizing the reality of who you are. Right? That joy is the experience of actualizing the reality of who you are. So it's kind of like we're like a seed. right? The, a seed includes the entire story of the tree in it already, but in a state of potential. And the quote-unquote yearning of any seed is to grow out into the fullest expression of what it already is inside. Right? And so what we see, though, is, and this is going to be a little bit of a deeper principle in Kabbalistic thought, is that we're going to see, if we understand things correctly, that we are able to see how they show themselves on all sorts of different levels in life. Like, for example, actually, this is one of the ideas of the word, the word Kabbalah. People know that the word Kabbalah is from the Hebrew word lekabel, to receive, because we're receiving deeper teachings that have been received by the student from the teacher. And that's fine, that's true. A less known understanding of the concept of Kabbalah is that the word Kabbalah is related to the Hebrew word makbil, which means parallel. parallel, parallel. Because one of the foundational principles of all Kabbalistic thought is that everything here in the physical world is a parallel to a deeper spiritual reality. And therefore, this means then that if we understand a principle properly, we should be able to see how it shows up, how it reveals itself, how it's manifests on all levels, physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual. And so, just one sec, and so what we're going to do now is, now we've laid out really the concept of joy, we're going to be able to see is that this concept of joy, that joy is built and joy is <coughs> experienced based on the, how we're going ahead and actualizing the reality of who we are into fruition, we're going to be able to see how that shows up and that shows forth on all levels, physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual. But before that, yeah, go ahead. Kabbalah, there's nothing more from the Kabbalah to receive, so again, parallel, so we're receiving the Kabbalah. Again, uh, if we want to relate these two <laughs> definitions, I'm not, this is not a conflict. Yes, it's res it means receive, and yes, it also so is connected to the concept of parallel. Hebrew? Huh? Is the Makbil modern Hebrew? 
It's it's uh, it's in the holy books. It's in. It's in. No, that's a different word. That's a different word. But makbil parallel is mem kuf bet yud lamed, and it's in all the ancient. Jewish books. Uh, it's not uh, just. It's not an invention of the last hundred, hundred fifty years. No, you can find these in books that are hundreds of years old. Okay, so, so. Um, but anyway, just now that you're raising the issue, the truth is that uh, I don't want to go into it. It's a little bit of a tangent, but you can connect these two meanings. I mean, to say, in order to receive somebody, you need to align yourself with them. You need to parallel them in order to be in their lane, so to speak, in order to receive from them. So this is one of the ideas. Okay, but for now, okay, one of the concepts is that. Okay. So again, if this concept of joy is that joy is the experience of actualizing the reality of who you are, so let's see how that plays out on all levels, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual. Let's start off at the bottom, right? For example, if you want to go ahead and actualize the reality of who you are, actualize your potential, but on the physical level, where would you go? If you want to actualize your physical potential, take your physical potential from a state of potential to a state of actualization, where would you go to do that? Gut response, go for it. You go to the gym. Right? Now imagine you got a person who, who's in the gym and they're lifting weights. Does it look like they're having a fun time? No, usually not. Right? Certainly not if they just started. However, a few weeks, give them a few weeks into it at least, a few weeks, a month, right? And they might not be looking like they're having a good time. They might not be looking like they're having a fun time. But what are they feeling inside? Right? Basically, as long as it takes for their, in their mind to turn the pain into gain, they're starting to feel a certain sense of fulfillment, a certain sense of fullness of self as they go ahead and go to the gym day in, day out. Isn't that right? right? And, so, this is the, and so already, on the physical level, by the way, they haven't even dealt with their person. They haven't even dealt with themselves as a human being, as a person emotionally. But already physically, they're growing physically. And emotionally, they're actually already starting to feel better about themselves. Right? Matter of fact, by the way, we intuit this concept a little bit. That when you see someone who's kind of like depressed or kind of like just down and out or like lethargic, say, oh, at least get this guy to go for a job, get moving. You're already intuit that there's a certain a person needs to go ahead and move. A person needs to go ahead and start to physically, at least, on the very least, to go ahead and start moving forward with something. Right? Okay. So this is the idea already on the physical level. We see that joy is the experience of actualizing the reality of who you are. Let's take it up a notch, right? Um, emotionally and psychologically, right? Imagine you have a guy, most people here are American, I take it. Right? Imagine you have a guy who is, you know, that kid, he's like a, that soup, he wants to be that Super Bowl quarterback. Already at age seven, this kid, he's in the little leagues and he's playing uh, football and he wants to be that Super Bowl quarterback. Every, whenever he's dreaming, this is what he's dreaming about. He's dreaming about becoming that Super Bowl quarterback. And sure enough, he continues on his path. He's in high school, and he makes the team as a, foot, uh, as a quarterback. He does very well, to the point that he gets recruited by a university. And in university, he also is very successful to the point where he gets drafted into the NFL. Right? And he's living, he's doing well in the NFL. We catch up with him a few years into his career. And he is, his team is down by four points. And they've, they just got the ball on their own 20-yard line. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, just you'll get the point, ignore the example. And the two, two minutes left on the clock. And he drives his team down the field. And then, with zero time remaining on the clock, he throws this pass over the shoulder, touchdown pass. Ah, the crowd goes wild, right? And they run up to him, of course, and they say, hey, you just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do next? And of course, he says, Go to I'm going to Disney World, right? <laughs> Amazing. And so now, a day later, right? This guy, most amazing experience. Can you hear the idea that a day later, he goes, uh, from, from that day on, from a day afterwards, for the end of his life, right, what's this guy, when he's dreaming, what's he dreaming about, right? Like up to this point in his life, he's been dreaming about winning the Super Bowl. He wins the Super Bowl. The day after, from then to the rest of his life, when he's dreaming, what's he dreaming about? How he won the Super Bowl. Isn't that interesting? How he, he's reminiscing about that time when he won the Super Bowl. 
So it means before he gets, before he wins the Super Bowl, he's dreaming about winning the Super Bowl. After he wins the Super Bowl, he's reminiscing about that time when he won the Super Bowl. That's what he's dreaming about. So what is this moment of winning the Super Bowl, right? Because it's, it's ecstasy, it's a high, it's joy. What is going on there that this guy, his whole life revolves around it? If we could put our finger on what it is that's going on here, on what it is that this day is all about for him, we, should go, we could go a long way in determining really what makes us tick. Why we work the way we work, how we work, what, 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 impact, what inspires us, what, what makes us, what are we passionate about? We could understand a lot about how we work. So my friends, what is that moment? You tell me. The pinnacle of his profession. The pinnacle of his profession, that is all true. What, what is happening for him in that moment? He reached his goal. He reached his goal. Put another way, we've been talking about it so far. Right? Can we say that that is the moment, right? That is the moment when his journey meets destination, when the process meets the experience, when potential meets actualization, right? And we love that, right? Let me give you another example, right? Imagine you have a person goes out on a, on a, on a journey, he decides he's gonna, be a, he's gonna be a mountain climber. He is going to climb a mountain. He picks a mountain and it's a four week climb. And this guy starts climbing and he is a week into the climb and already it's very hot outside and he's sweating bullets and here comes, he's kind of tired already, right? And here comes his friend, flies over in his brand new helicopter. And he looks over to his buddy, climbing the mountain. He opens up the window and he says, hey buddy, what are you doing? And the guy says, what do you mean, what am I doing? What does it look like? I'm climbing the mountain. He says, what you, what's your goal? He says, my goal is to get to the top of the mountain. He says, oh, if that's your goal, check this out. I got this brand new helicopter. Leather interior, AC's blasting. Listen, jump on in. I'll have you up there in 10 minutes. It looks like you got three weeks to go. So what does the climber say to the helicopter guy? No, right. no thanks, right? Because really the, the mountain climber made a little bit of a mistake. His goal isn't to get to the top of the mountain. His goal really is in the climb. His goal is in every step of the way. And so you fast forward three weeks down the road, we catch up with him again, and here he's right at the top of the mountain, he's about to finish the climb, right? And if this was the movie, if this was all a movie, this is when they would like put it in slow motion. And you'd have that music in the background. Dun dun dun, dun 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 dun, guy taking the final steps, right? And then he goes ahead and he maybe, he puts his, he, he gets to the top of the mountain, he puts one foot in, one foot over, he takes out of his backpack, he's got a little flag there, Puts it down, dun, da, 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 right? And so, and this is very, and it's all very inspiring. But can you hear the idea? Like again, what is going on with this person? What's going on over here? Right? This is why we focus in on this point of the movie. Why is this the pinnacle of the movie? Right? Yes, it's the pinnacle of the movie. Why? Because again, that's the, that's the place. That's the time where potential is meeting actual. Right? Potential is meeting actualization. Process is meeting the experience. The journey is coming in contact with destination. Matter of fact, if we can just freeze that one frame where, where he's, he, he throws one leg over to the top of the mountain and he's still got the other leg still in the climbing of the mountain, if we can just freeze that, that moment of just getting there, that's the moment that we all love. Because just getting there is one leg in destination, one leg in journey. That feeling of just, that is that moment that if we, that is a moment we can pinpoint, point our finger at that potential is meeting actualization, right? And we love that. We live for that. This is, if we can freeze that and sell it, ooh, we'd make a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? And, and the question is, why do we love that? Why is that what makes us tick? Why is that what it's all about for us. Before we get to that, actually, we're gonna ask, we're gonna, we are gonna, God willing, answer that question. Well, we'll see if we answer that question tonight. But before we get to that, let's make another observation, right? And that is that if we can understand what joy is all about, then guess what, my friends? We should be able to understand what depression is all about. If we can understand that joy is the experience of actualizing the reality of who you are, so then depression is the experience of not. not actualizing the reality of who you are, right? That means that depression is going to start to take hold when we don't know which way to go 
for when we know which way to go, and we are running in the other direction. Eventually, the presses just start to take hold. Right? And here again, society does us another disservice by putting an incorrect calculation in the back of our minds. You ready? You can fill in the blank here. Ready? If it feels good, do it. Do it right? That's what society has taught us. And that comes along, though, with an implication. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. So we grow up with this in our unconscious, in our subconscious, over and over and over again. And then, as a good American, of course, we come in contact with 20 minutes of free time. And so we say, OK, if it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. 20 minutes of free time, what am I going to do with that? Good American, gut response? So, there you go, surf the web, look at your phone, my day, we'd, call, we'd say plop, plop down in the couch and start flipping the channel, start flipping the remote, right? So you settle in on, I don't know, MTV, right? Okay, so how long before you start to feel like you want to blow your brains out? Uh, a few minutes, 20 minutes, two minutes, right? Truth is probably the quicker you want to blow your brains out, probably the bigger soul you have, a separate conversation. But the point is at some point, right? Oh, very good. Okay, good, good. The point is you're going to get there at some point, right? So, probably. You can't, you can't do that, yeah. So, but here, here's the, here's, the, here's the point. You ready? Point is like this. Think about it. When are you even more comfortable than when you're plopped in your couch? When you're asleep in your bed. And when are you even more at peace than when you're asleep? When you're dead, isn't that interesting? Because you said it, not me. Hmm. Right? When you're dead. Now, do you hear, can you hear the idea that the culture that has raised us has put in the back of our minds that the path to joy is to get in touch with the thing that touches the thing that touches death? Huh? Comfort, sleep, death. Right? Read the Talmud, read the Gemara, it says, the, it says that sleep is one sixtieth of death, meaning it's sleep is a flavor of death. So all we're ad adding here is that comfort is one sixtieth of sleep. Comfort is a flavor of sleep, meaning to say that essentially com comfort is one three hundred and sixtieth of death. So death is comfort. Com is the ultimate comfort. In a certain respect, well, let's let's. Peace. And by the way, let's let, let's just show how this is true. Think about it. I mean, what is the culture that raised us again? What is the vision? of paradise. You tell me what's the first thing you think about. Everybody has their own. Say it again. No, not everyone has their own. What's the culture we put in the back of our mind? He said it. On the beach. Oh, laying there in white sandy beach. Maybe I got one of these glasses with the umbrella sticking out, one of these drinks, right? right? Maybe I got somebody is uh, feeding me grapes. Right? And it's like, I don't even have to move a muscle. Ah. Well, if you don't want to move a muscle, guess what? Like death, you're good to go. So. Meaning to say... But plenty of people do things and are entertained and enjoy it and get the endorphins going and love it. Yeah, and yeah. That are active things. They ski. They Great. scuba dive. They water ski. They climb mountains. Great. To the top. They don't Great. just lie and watch TV. In their Great. Place. Then why is it that I can so say to a, a group of 40 people, and I can say, what is society's, what is our vision, gut response of paradise? And like 80% they're going to say, okay, lying on a white because sandy beach. Because that's the... the uh, that, that's the, the Madison like Avenue vision of relaxing, but a lot yeah. of people relaxation is not doing nothing. It's we're doing talk, something very active. Good. So we're talking about so, relaxation here. We're talking about relaxation. We're talking too, about comfort. But, so I'm saying relaxation and comfort isn't just lying on the beach. It's also doing something that's very much active. But to you, that's great. You're talking heat, the definition of hedonism isn't necessarily just lying around on the beach. It's, you so you want other Gamora. hedonism uh, things? If for you, the ultimate thing yeah. to have fun doing and enjoying and relaxing is to sit and study Gomorrah, Then you're going to sit. We're, and study what, we're, what we're saying is here that the culture. If you don't like my example, fair enough. But it, what we're saying here is that the culture that has raised us. Right, has put in the back of our minds that, that there's a there's certain equation going on here. And that is that comfort is going to lead to happiness. And that's an equation that is made by society that raised us in general. Uh, if you didn't get that, good on you. But what the mass is, this it is, put, this is what's... Accomplishment and the comfort are two different things. That's the point I'm trying but to you make. But you started talking about the football player. Yeah, so I did. So that's a very American thing, the idea that, well, you got to put in the time and work and hard. And right, and so that's going to be bring us closer to a certain so satisfaction. There, you can't, there's, you can't no, 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 those, there, those there isn't. Those are both very American things. Yeah, they, it is, players. it is. And, and for every football player, you have 
three million couch potatoes. So that's the point I'm trying to make. You have three million arm, armchair quarterbacks, right? So for that guy who puts in the for that for that guy who puts in the work, you got another three million is a low ex, uh, estimate. It would probably more like thirty million or three hundred well, million is the whole country. So that's not fair. You get the point I'm trying to make. Yes, you're right. That exists. But that for again for every one who actually did that, there's literally a million people who that's not what they're doing. So the point is, what are the masses being fed in general, right? Obviously, you're always going to find exceptions, um, and I'm and I'm listing those. So and I'm starting to say that yeah, you're going to become closer to joy as that person, right? Rather than the one who is flipping the channels, right? And, and let's just see that this is like let like let me give you another example, okay? Like take um, and, and this is really what's at the core of it. That imagine you have um, let's say you have a woman from a few hundred years ago, okay? Let's say. Part of her life was doing the laundry. Like, so for this gal to go ahead and to do the laundry, right, 400 years ago, is a full day affair, right? Five, six hours, you got to get the clothes, take it all the way down to the river, do whatever they do in the river, rinse it, wring it out, take it back up. Full day affair. Now, laundry, take it, throw it in a machine, push a button, switch it over an hour later, push another button, right? You just saved like five hours there, right there, right? So the question is now, okay, so what do you do with that time, right? If you go ahead and you kick back and you say, oh, I just got five hours, five hours free and start flipping the remote and, you know, watching Seinfeld reruns and Oprah reruns, probably after a while you're not going to feel so good about yourself, right? If you go ahead and you take that time and you find some other higher side of yourself to go ahead and live out from a state of potential to state of actualization, probably you're going to be feeling pretty good about your time, right? Probably going to feel pretty joyous. And so... The point here is that, you know, it's funny, our society calls it killing time, right? So think about it. How many moments in time must you kill before you start to feel a little bit dead inside, right? How many moments in time must you kill before you start to feel like a dead man walking? Right? again, the bigger the soul, probably the quicker, right? The bigger, probably the quicker you start to feel like this. And so, and so you know, this is... This is, the, this is really getting to the crux of the epidemic of depression that we have in the culture that has raised us, okay? Uh, again, I'm not talking here about some medical extreme exception to the rule. For, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the fact that we have an epidemic in the culture that raised us of, and we all probably, most of us probably deal with it within ourselves, right, of this, of really a feeling of depression, a feeling of, on the one hand, I feel my pulse and I'm alive, but I'm feeling dead inside, right? And it's rooted in this. It explains also the idea, uh, a big question that plagues our society, which is look around. You know, we got lights, we got electricity, we got running water, we got these funky gadgets, these phones, crazy stuff. If we were to take some of this stuff back in time, three, four, five hundred years, and show them back there what we have now, they would be like, wow, it's utopia. You know, finally, the human race has made it. Everyone must be blissfully happy. And then you show up, and then you get here. And it's not like that. And so people ask the question, how could it be? We've never had it better. And people are feeling down. And what we're saying here addresses that issue, right? Which is that it's not about the technology and the comfort. And I'm not against the technology. This is not an anti-technology talk. The question is, okay, what are you doing with these advantages? What are you doing? What are we doing with these these abilities that certain things are easier than they used to be, or have certain capabilities that we didn't used to have? What are we doing with that? Are we, if we're doing that just to intake, and that's the end all, be all, and the goal, and the sum total, so then yeah, that's not going to lead us to joy and happiness, right? If we go ahead and take it and use that to go ahead and actualize ourselves even more, or to go ahead and to move something positive, express some higher side of ourselves, and do something worthwhile with that, so then, yeah, you're going to feel really good about that, right? And so, and so anyway, this is a concept of, of joy and depression. And let's realize also then, right, that this is what we're talking about when we're talking about Yaakov versus Asaph, right? Because again, Yaakov, the whole idea was there's two sides here, right? There's a certain level of clarity each time, a certain wholesomeness. See, what, what is, what's reality? The t second part is Yosef Olim, the Torah. How I go ahead and live out that reality. What are the, the methods by which, in detail, I'm going to go ahead and live this out? That's going to be a whole, that's going to be a person that's 
in a certain respect, I don't know if holistic is the right word, but a balanced person. On the one hand, right, you have certain people that we meet all the time. Certain people are more into the inspiration of things. Other people are more into the academic uh, doing of things. But the balance is to find the, somehow merge the two, right? To go ahead and to, on, on the one hand, have the philosophy, have the inspiration, have the clarity, and then to go ahead also, and what does that mean practically in terms of how I'm going to live my life? That's the, that's the balance, right? The inspiration versus the actualization. The visionary versus the administrator. It's the only way to have anything in a wholesome way, right? Then on the other hand, you have an ace of. Right? And the ace of, again, is searching out. How do we go ahead and push this guy off track? How do we go ahead and get in the way and find some way to distract him or to get him to do things not fully? And then that will start to lead to a certain loss of self. That will be the beginning of the downfall of this person. Right? Also, by the way, there's another Yetzirah. There's another evil inclination in a person called Lavan. Right? What's Lavan's goal? Lavan is to really be cage la corte col. He tries to get rid of everything. Ace of is already working within the re certain reality. He's trying to work. He's trying to work. He's trying to hunt down a system, get you off track. Lavan tries to trick you the whole story. Right? Lavan, of course, we know the story. Lavan is the one who switches. Uh, right? Switches Rachel of Leah. Right? So. So he's the one who shows one thing, and calls it one thing. But really, it's something else, right? It's the whole trickery, right? That's why we call it. That's an interesting thing. We call him. He's he's a negative person in the Torah, but he's Lavan, which means white, right? So it's like ah, here, let me show you some purity. But really, he's not being pure. Really, he's not being real. Really, he's not saying things as it is, right? And so that's the Lavan concept, or this concept of a certain switcheroo, right? And that's what the, of course, there's that Yetzirah in our lives. Right? Because, of course, the Yetzir, the Yetzir Tov, the good inclination, right, says, do this, it's good. And the evil inclination never says, do this, because it's bad. Right? The good inclination says, do this, because it's good. The evil inclination says, do this, because it's really good. Right? That's love. Right? That's the love concept. Pulling a switch. And so, and so go ahead. Isn't that, you, you, he was supposed to do it. Slap in the face to Yaakov, because Leah on the wedding night, when he sees, wait, you're not Rachel, she says, well, you did the same thing to your father, so what are you complaining about? And then Lavan says to him, hey, it's not our minhag here to have the, the younger before the older go yeah. first. So basically the whole thing is like a, you know, payback to Yaakov for, for even though he was supposed to Good, get so the, the yeah, birthright, before, yeah. it, he, wasn't, he shouldn't have done it in the way that he did. Oh, okay. So if you look at it as the whole thing was, was basically meant to be his punishment, Okay. Then Laban isn't really doing anything evil here. He's doing what he's supposed uh, that's a slippery, to do. Uh, oh, that's a slippery slope. So you can say that about every. You could say that about every villain the in the, the history. The there you go. Right. He was, uh, he was supposed you could to marry, say that about every villain from 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 Laban to Hitler. You could say that. Well, he was supposed to marry Leia, and we know she was All good in the end. All good in the end. This is all part of the plan. You can always say that. You can say that about every negative thing that ever happened. This is also part of it. No, no, and it's true. But it it has its place. A negative thing that happened. You could so say that about every negative thing that happened. No, right. But I'm saying this wasn't really such a negative you thing. You could say that about every negative thing. You can't thing. compare that to, to slavery in Egypt. You know, right. it's not the same. Fair, fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. But, um, but uh, the point is that from love inside of it, he didn't have such good intentions. Don't worry. You know what I mean? He's not considered to be a guy who is, uh, you know, looking for the, the, the good. So this is really a story. And by the way, you see this again also. In the name for Yaakov as well, you see that this is the story of what Yaakov is all about. Right? Because Yaakov also is that concept of Yud Ekev. Yud is considered always to be the most spiritual of all the letters. And everybody says that, but why? So the Maharal of Prague, one of the great uh, Kabbalists and philosophers of, uh, of Judaism in the last 500 years, says that if you look at the letter Yud, right, <coughs> the letter Yud essentially is like a dot. It's like you take the quill, right, you dip it into the ink, and then as soon as the quill hits the parchment, boom, already you technically have a yud. It's like a dot, right? You technically have a yud, so it's something that exists there on the page, but it hasn't been really drawn out into physical form yet. So it's existence beyond physical limitation. So spirituality is something spiritual. Existence beyond the limitation of physical. And so this is the concept of yud, the concept of spiritual. And it's, you could also look at it as an initial spark, a burst of inspiration, whatever you might call it. And then what's akev? Akev is the heel, right? The lowest point, the point that's totally touching the ground, right? This is, again, these two aspects. Ishtam, Yoshev Olim, seeing God, clarity. But then practically, how am I living it out? From a burst of inspiration 
to the practical, to the healed, to being grounded, to living it out in a practical, grounded way. This is the concept of Yaakov, this is the concept of joy, and this is, I think, one of the ideas and one of the ways we can look at this week's Torah portion and these portions that we're having now and understand these concepts is when we take a look at, take a, an inner look, an inner look at the Torah, understand the Torah that really it's not something that happened way back when, but the Torah is something that's going on within each of us. And we understand, see, see ourselves in these stories and see how these stories are relevant to us in our lives because that's really what it's here for because this is what Torah is all about. Torah is the concept of teachings, teachings for our life. And so it's really all about us. That's really the purpose of it all. And so, yes, of course, these things happen in history. We're not denying that. But why is it being given to me? Why is it something that is relevant to my life now? That's what the Torah is here for, is to be relevant to our life now. It's not to teach us a history lesson. Right? And so to be able to understand the Torah in this light and take a more inner approach to the Torah and see the, reveal the Torah in another layer of depth, this is what I wanted to share with you this evening. I hope it's meaningful. Questions, thoughts, ideas, anybody? Go ahead. It's like uh, with Hanukkah, what Yavan, Greek, is your Yeah, sure. You is the spiritual of the God. Love is like the bring connecting and bring it down. Connecting it, and the known is like bringing heaven down to making everything physical. Right, so the thing, the, right, so that would say, that's how we would interpret that. There are people who actually interpret Yavan, I think it's Maharal also, who, said, who, who says something similar, and then Nun is not just any Nun, it's like a Nun Sofit. It's like Mom is uh, making everything, even the spiritual physical. So there's an idea of connecting the spiritual to the physical. Then there's an the idea of turning that which is spiritual, turning it physical, right, which is, um, which is how we would inter interpret the Yavan concept, the Greek concept, which is known for, you know, an emphasis on, on externality and physicality as being the sum total of all it is, right? So in other words, uh, what Judaism is trying to do is reveal inner spirituality inherent in the physical world. And so what Yavan Greece is trying to do, in a certain respect, they're the anti-Jew. You could say that about a couple of nations in different ways. But the Greek concept is, is, is to even that thing that might look spiritual, no, no, that's physical. That's just physical, too. That's the Greek concept and so it's funny that the, the culture that raised us calls that the their period of uh, you know that period of expressing it the period now that goes back to those philosophies as the enlightenment right uh, Jewishly we call that the endarkenment right because Jewish people should be a light unto the nations what does that mean reveal godliness even in a world that seems to be maybe not have God in it even a physical world that's enlightenment right and so what they call enlightenment we would call endarkenment you know and that's why the Jew, how do you say Jew in Hebrew from the word? Yehudi. Yehudi, from the word Yehuda. What's Yehuda? Yehuda is the four letters of the name of Hashem, Yud and He and Vav and He, with a Dalit. What's a Dalit? A Dalit is, on the one hand, it's the four different directions, one horizontal line, one vertical line, four, four different directions, the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, right? But also, it's dal, the word Dalit is from the word Hebrew word Dal, which means poor, right? And that's why the word Dalit also related to the word Delet. Spelled the same way. Dalet, Dalet is spelled the same way. Dalet is a, is a door because a poor person goes from door to door. But when we're talking spiritually, it means someone who's spiritually poor. So what's the Jew? The, the Jew is the one who, Yehudi, from the word Yehuda, is the one who brings the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He to the Dalet, to the one who's poor, who's the one who's spiritually poor, to the one who doesn't have God, who doesn't, isn't aware of it. So that's what the Jew is supposed to be, enlightening that Dalet, enlightening the four corners, that's four again, Dalit, not even four corners of the globe, if you will, enlightening the ones who don't have it, right? And what's the Yavan, what's the Greece? Exactly the opposite, trying to take that light out of the world and trying to go ahead and say, no, 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 it's just, it's just the external thing that you see. There's nothing more than meets the eye. Right? Um, something, go ahead. something I heard uh, also, uh, yeah. the Yaakov and Esau, we're, we're acting spiritually like uh, Yaakov, and we're also doing actions of Esau. Right. A thousand percent. So the, ideally, really, the truth is, um, ideally, we're supposed to be, really, Jewish people are supposed to be both. It's supposed to be a partnership here. They're twins, right? Really, I mean, the problem was that Esau took his co Esau took his power and went in another direction. But really, the idea was that Yaakov would be that one sitting in the tent, right? And Esau would be the one out there living it out in the world. The problem is that, well, that, that's, a, that's a high avoda. That's a deep avoda. That's a deep work. You can pull it off even in, outside, right? And he, Rivka saw, he wasn't going in that direction, right? But this also explains a little bit why Yitzchak found, liked him, right? Because Yitzchak appreciated where, but, but he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. He wasn't accomplishing it. And so therefore, Rivka knew that Yaakov needs to take them both on. Right? Yaakov needs to take the, the, the inner aspect on, also with the as, uh, external aspect on. And that's what we struggle with. 
I'm sure still, we struggle with all of them. doing some actions that are a self, and that's what we're struggling with. There you go, okay. And we want, and we're, we want to be spiritually like Yaakov. Yeah. And uh, we're supposed to do, though, we're supposed to live out the ace of sight, too, sometimes, you know, in the proper way. And, um, yeah, I mean, well, that's what sometimes we need to take those ace of hands, you right. know what I mean? Sometimes God will, we should take, we should really take note of that right now. If, if it's not benefiting us, that we really need to overcome and, uh, and, and change that. Sure. Cool. Okay, my friends, I hope this is meaningful. I hope you enjoyed. Anyone wants to hang out, chill, talk a little bit, I'm right here.